Hi there, glad you could join us. Uh, James Bell here with Growing in Grace. We are in Dr. Ed Wheat's book, Love Life for Every Married Couple, a wonderful book. We're ready for chapter seven, page 84 and following. Romantic love, the thrill factor. Well, all you have to do is uh, go to a bookstore and there are large sections on romance, romance novels. People love uh, shows on television that are all about romance. And a lot of that, of course, as you read that, uh, you're taken into a world of imagination and vicariously trying to fulfill something that most people don't have. And so they go into the world of imagination and of what they imagine it would be like if they had romance. Maybe romance is a distant memory. You had some of that when you were dating or in the early years of your marriage. So uh, romance, uh, romantic thought, romantic love is uh, it's kind of like, uh, well, life is kind of dull without it. And so people will sometimes surprise themselves by what they will do in search of it. And yet most people never turn to the Word of God and the principles of God's Word to find the real solution. In fact, because we emphasize, and rightly so, the need for agape love, the love is something that you do, is sacrificial love in action. You say, well, that's not romantic. Well, uh, if you want a genuine romantic love that's not going to fade away, that's not going to die on you, then you're going to have to have some agape. Uh, counselor Jay Adams tells of couples who come to his office and they say, we don't love each other anymore. And I've heard him say the same thing. And he says, my answer is, I'm sorry to hear that. You'll just have to learn how. Well, that doesn't sound very romantic, does it? Well, it is possible to learn to be romantic. Uh, romantic love can be learned emotionally. Uh, and there are two ways. By utilizing God-given imaginative thought and by providing the right emotional climate. We've already mentioned that People run to romance novels and television shows and movies uh, and vicariously they enter into another world and they have a romantic experience which by and large will result in some form of lust or some form of mental adultery. But we have these compelling feelings and we have to learn how to develop them. And so we want to begin by, first of all, removing some roadblocks, anger, a lack of forgiveness. Uh, you, you don't have romantic feelings and emotions with someone who is always in your face or you're always in theirs and you have bitterness and resentment. Uh, romance comes from a, a response. You're responding to how your, your spouse looks, how they feel, the things they do, the way they do them. Uh, you think of favorable things. You, you choose to uh, block out the, the, uh, the negative. And so, again, these are choices that create, help create an environment. Um, so one of the things, most, most couples, I'll say, do you have any good memories? Yes. Of course, right now, they're hopeless. Uh, there are daggers being shot at each other. But most couples do have good memories. And so you make the choice to go back and remind yourself. You go back and not pick up a novel, but you go back and pick up the story of your life. And you go back to those times of good memories. And you fill your mind with that. And you remember how you felt 
Uh, love is more than feelings, but we have feelings, and there is the love of feelings, the love of emotions. You remember how you felt when you first met your spouse and some of the wonderful experiences uh, that you had. And so you, you, you begin to spend some time in your thinking with sensitive appreciation for those good times. Now, if you spend your day thinking negatively about your spouse, well, guess how you're going to feel about him or her at the end of the day? Very negative. But if you choose to, to think on the good things, then you're going to be blessed. I was sitting in my office with an individual, and he was talking about some good things of his wife. But here was a man who was eat up with resentment and bitterness toward his wife. But in the course of conversation, he's talking about some good things that his wife does and how that some particular people really, really liked what she did. And all of a sudden, he sat up in his chair and raised his voice, and he said, I can't stand it when people say good things about her. They don't know her. Well, before I could uh, expose his need, I had to pull the dagger out of my own heart because when he said that, I went back to a time when we were struggling and we were in a difficult time in our marriage and I was at a particular location and some people were praising my wife about something and I hated it. I didn't say anything, but in my spirit, I hated it, and it was all tied up with resentment and bitterness that was on the loose at that time. So you go back and you remember how you fell in love. You remember the good times that you had. You remember the things that you appreciated, and you began to compliment, and you began to talk about those good things. At this point, Somewhere on page 88 or 89, I've written at the bottom of my page, and I always give an assignment to couples to go home and write a letter. Uh, it has three parts. You write a letter of past good times, and then you write uh, the second part of the letter, thanks and appreciation for all the positive things from your spouse. And then you, the last part of the letter has to do with commitment for the future. And then once you get the letter written, you go out for an evening, a nice restaurant, and then you open the letters and let each other read the letters and share an evening together. It's been a beautiful experience for a lot of people. A lot of people have had a very difficult time doing it because they're crossing a bridge they haven't been over in a long time. But it's very powerful to allow uh, positive, imaginative thought. Um, if you don't go down that road, you will go down the road daydreaming about the wrong people in the wrong scenarios, and it'll be very destructive. Um, I remember a gentleman who was struggling with lust because of a lot of temptations that was on his job. And so, a part of our strategy was for him to make a choice when he got in his vehicle to drive home to start thanking the Lord for his wife. And his previous pattern had been he would get home, uh, give his wife a peck on the cheek, get down on the floor and rumble with the boys, and then read the paper and wait for dinner. I said, well, when you get home, uh, you give your wife a kiss on the cheek or a big hug, and you get on the floor and you rumble with the boys for a minute. And then uh, they, they lived in a home that had a, like a bar. And now some people don't want anybody around when they're cooking. This lady was fine with it. You sit at that bar and you ask her about her day and you tell her about yours. It's amazing how that kind of communication opened the door to romantic feelings and restored romantic feelings. And because there was increased and renewed romantic feelings and joys and thrills with each other, then at 
the next day at work in this place of temptation, there was more power to say no to that because the fires were burning strong in the marriage in a very holy way. And so uh, using uh, your powers to uh, concentrate, to think about, to fill your mind with that which is good, that which is right, that which is holy, uh, will serve you well. So again, they're, they're, they're in this process, somebody has to initiate. Don't wait for the other person. Now, granted, the husband should be an initiator. I understand that. But don't wait. Initiate. Give responses. Uh, if there's anything in the past, clear it up. Ask for forgiveness. Give forgiveness. Uh, refuse the spirit of rejection. Go back and think of the positive things that are true about your spouse. And also, uh, between you and the Lord, make fresh commitments. This, what is my responsibility here? Love your spouse and watch them become who they are supposed to be. So this is a very uh, powerful chapter, and uh, involved with this is also another aspect of physical touching. One of the things I like about this book is that it points out the power of non-sexual physical touching. Obviously, there is touching that leads to sex, but there should be uh, times in a marriage, significant times in a marriage, where the bedroom is not the goal. The goal is just to care for the person, to love the person, to cultivate the relationship. And so there is non, what we term non-sexual uh, touching, eye contact, uh, listening, making sure that you're listening to the person. And again, this shows value. And when you show value to a person, they begin to, to blossom. We could go back and point out that uh, one of the things that thrills us in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is that he has given us his word and he's given us his Holy Spirit and so as we open the Bible and as we read the Word of God, um, we're reading God's love letter to us. And as we read God's love letter to us, we are encouraged and we are thrilled and we are freshly empowered to then love Him because He first loved us. And so the romantic as aspect of love is not something that is uh, man-made or or manufactured by uh, something that is uh, not going to last. Here's a person who's been unkind and unloving. They come home with flowers. They're trying to make amends, maybe trying to get to the bedroom, but the wife senses that there's no sincerity. And so but what this chapter is talking about is the romantic aspect of of loving a person for who they are and for the blessings that they are and cultivating that interest in each other. And it will be blessings. There will be many blessings to come in your marriage for many, many years. Cultivating romantic love. God bless you. We'll see you again next time.